Welcome to the Politics of Everything. I'm Amber Danes, your host and podcast producer. This is a half hour of power, a podcast dropping every week where I unpack the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment, equality, and much, much more. Our guests are seasoned in the field or topic of their choice, even if you've not heard of them yet. This is a non-partisan show. So while I love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate of ideas, this is not a purely blue, white, green program. Please subscribe, tune in and enjoy the politics of everything. The politics of business growth is what we're examining today with an entrepreneur who has experienced that in spades. At just 25, with only $50 to his name, Justin Herald set about changing the course of his life. He created Attitude Inc., a clothing brand that became an international licensing success that turned in over excess of $20 million. In 2005, he was named International Entrepreneur of the Year. Justin has also received the Future Leaders Award, which recognises him as being one of the 50 most influential leaders in the next generation in Australia. Today, Justin is Managing Director of Customer Culture, one of Australia's leading customer service and customer engagement training companies that not only teaches the staff how to give great service, but more importantly, why it is needed. He also recently launched juniorentrepreneur.com, which is an online space that teaches kids how to take an idea and turn it into a business. That program has had massive international success so far. He's also the author of eight international best-selling books and personally mentors over 100 business owners each year and is regarded as one of Australia's most sought-after speakers with audiences of around 150,000 people each year. Justin Harold is a man who's done so much with his life and I welcome him warmly to the politics of everything. Hello. Hello. How are you? Yeah, doing doing well. I like to start a little bit at the beginning of um, as far back as you're willing to go, but growing up, did you always want to be part of the business world or did you want to be an astronaut or something fabulous like that? Oh, no, I wasn't even aiming that high. Um, no, look, the only thing I passed in school was recess, so I um, wasn't really into the whole education. I wasn't into anything I, you know, was probably one of the youngest managers at Coles and Woolworths back in the olden days, or Super Kmart it was called back in those days. But So I was just doing that, and I actually am an accidental business owner, really. I, I just started First Business Attitude purely based upon wanting to upset someone in my dad's church because he's a minister, and they kept on telling me I had an attitude problem. So that's how it actually started. <laughs> I love it. So a bit of a rebel by the sounds of it. Yeah, well, I, you know, I was just having some fun. I still am 25 years later, but I just wanted to upset her that that week and then come up with another idea the following week to upset her. But, you know, on that day, people wanted to buy my T-shirts and it sort of went from there and I had to work out how to do business real quick. But I've always done it my way though. Excellent. So um, we're looking at growth today. What does that really mean? For some people, it might be about making lots of money, but it's obviously more than that. Can you share a bit of an example about you know what growth really means and, and how it might define what you've done in your career? Yeah, look, I'm not into the, the whole money maketh the man thing because I've met a lot of rot, rich idiots. So that doesn't really float my boat. I, for me, it's using an analogy, growth, if you've got kids, we've got too many of them, but they go through the whole growing pains. And for me, growth is about challenges, is about pain and being uncomfortable. And it's about, you know, you will never grow your comfort zone while you're sitting in it. So for me, it's always been one of those things that I've made sure that I'm constantly out of my comfort zone and I'm now comfortable being uncomfortable, if that makes any sense. Excellent. So, I mean, for you, you've obviously done multiple things in the life of an entrepreneur. I often think it's sometimes luck, lots of hard work at times, and also that failure, that growth that you talk about before you actually take off and succeed. What would you advise younger leaders who might be starting out on their sort of career journey or work journey to how do they should approach this entrepreneurial life if they're not if they're new to it? Because some people will find it confronting and it won't be for everyone. And I think that's the thing. It's not People don't have a high risk appetite. They don't really enjoy, you know, the, the constants mm. of change, which I think is inevitable these days. But I think for some people, it's just not their thing. But how do you know that? And do you have any sort of, I guess, hindsight reflections that you could share with some people who might be starting out on this entrepreneurial life? Yeah, look, the, the first thing is you, you don't know what you don't know. I think 
Well, the, the benefit that, that I had when I started my first business is was the internet didn't exist and that, that actually was a benefit. Now I think there's too much information, wrong information, that people can get pretty quickly and then apply it to their situation. Problem with that, if if we're all the same, that that information would be quite correct for everyone. But I just knew I didn't know anything and I knew based upon that, and this is where people need to get this sort of stuck in their head, I knew that this was going to be harder. I knew that I didn't know what I was doing. I knew that I was going to make mistakes and I knew that I had to make them small and fast and learn from that's probably the, the biggest one. So I don't really make the same mistake twice. I, I All of my businesses, I've started with bugger all money, to be honest. Purely the first one was by default because I didn't have any. And then I proved that that could be done. So for me, I like taking that financial thing out of the equation. So if I go and spend a hundred grand setting up a business and it doesn't work, that's going to hurt. If I spend a hundred dollars and it doesn't work, then it doesn't matter. And um, so I just think what we've got to try and do is really stretch ourselves to figure out what we are good at. And, my, and look, I didn't know I was going to be good at business; had no clue. And and if you ask most people who knew me back then, there'd be no I no way that I'd ever be able to run a business. But I didn't know that, and I just gave it a crack. Mm, it's interesting. So you talk about you know some of those learnings and failings. Is there anyone that sort of stands out? It might be maybe from your first business, or it might even be more recently that really kind of resonates and would be great for people to have an understanding of you know what they could learn from that from that sure. failure of yours. It's a bit of vulnerability I'm asking for here, but I think that's no, no. so important in this in this story. Yeah, look, it's peaks and troughs. Yeah, look, my, probably the one that still sticks with me, and I'll find this guy one day, but. One of my first big sales was a, a, a big shop up in Queensland and I was really green. I had no idea you're supposed to have contracts or agreements and all this sort of stuff and he was selling my clothing pretty quickly and ordering really quickly and it start to, started to rack up and it ended up being around $36,000 that was owed and then all of a sudden he disappeared and that was a big wake-up call and I had someone the other day going, oh, it's only 30-something grand but when you start a business with 50 bucks, yeah. that really hurts. And I think it's the principle too that you know not everyone's doing the business the same way as you and that trust thing and of course you know having contracts is key but most people don't really think about that particularly if they have a rapport with someone or they're just so excited that yeah. someone actually wants to buy their wares. Yeah and and I think to be really honest it's even worse these days than ever before people are trying to find ways to not pay their bills or you know try to be dodgy it seems to be part of people's business plans some people's so trust is always a thing that I've really struggled with. I have been brought up that you believe what people tell you and I'm one of those silly people that do believe what people tell me. So, you know, you just got to really watch yourself. And and I'll, I'll come back to it again. You just try not to spend too much money setting yourself up because it, it's going to change. Whatever you, you've decided to do now, I guarantee you it would not be the same thing in a year's time. Absolutely. So growing into a bigger business is not for everyone. Some people are happy to keep it small because, you know, I always think bigger business, bigger problems in some ways, but you do need to plan to make any business work. How have you sort of done that? <laughs> okay. Um, this is where I upset most accountants. I've you never, don't do plans. I don't do plans, no. Um, <laughs> look, I, it's just my personality. I think what we're going to do, in, especially in, in business, if you want to start your own, is understand that your personality is extremely important in the process. So my personality, the, the person that I am, I'm not a planner. I'm, I, I just do whatever I want to do and then suffer the consequences. And that's the way I run my businesses. And it, for me, it works. My staff had to have an idea and plan, but their person, a lot of their personalities were very detail oriented. I'm, I'm big picture, so mm, I, we're very similar like that. Which for I mean, which means in my business, I have to hire people who do that. Yeah. You know, hire hire your weakness stuff, where it's like you can do all the systemization and you know all those pieces, but I just want to have the big ideas and go out there and sell it. Yeah, I'll give you an idea, an example of that, like. I um, put up on Facebook a while ago, I'm really excited to launch my junior entrepreneur program and my wife rings up and she said, when have you been thinking about this? I said, I haven't. I just thought I'd just put that up and see what, what people thought. <laughs> no, no content yet behind no it? No content. No, 193 people that day said, can I buy it for my kids? And then the next day I went out and bought the, all the recording equipment and stuff like that, then did it over a day. 
created the workbooks, and then a week and a half later it was out, and now it's gone global. So that's just one of that's sort of the what I do, but it works for me. It doesn't work for everyone else, but it you know it, it sort of suits my personality. So it's your personality, but I guess on that growth, uh, you know, idea, like the fact you had so many people sign up, and you know, basically it was what just a, an ad per se of what what they could expect without sort of having done all the work. That does kind of make sense because you're sort of testing the market hmm. before you invest too much time and energy and money into it. Yeah, absolutely. So that I mean, makes sense the last to me. thing I want to do, when we've got five daughters, is I don't want to be wasting money because they've always got some new hairbrush or something that we've got to buy. So I, <laughs> I just don't want to you know, waste my time either on, on things that may not be working. And there's too many people out there at the moment flogging a dead horse with a business that's never going to work. And that's where we've got to be very aware of what's going on. Mm, interesting. Um, so how do you scale a business fast? I mean, do you have any sort of tips and, and, and insight into how that can happen? Um, you're asking all the, the wrong questions to me today. Um, look, I just hung on for the ride. I did not know that it was going to go so big. But once again, if if you take those limiting beliefs away from the process, I have too many uh, new mentoring clients that start with me and go, oh, look, I'd like to get my business to such and such, but I don't think I can do that in the next two years. And they're 100% correct because they've just now put themselves into a box. So I didn't know that this was going to take off. The media loved the whole $50 story. I didn't think that was a massive thing because you don't really tell anyone you got a dollar twenty-five in the bank when you're 25 years old. So the media loved that. That then sort of created the growth and the buzz around that. And then people like Kylie that you had on the other day. So she, I, that's how I met Kylie. She had a, a company that then took my brand to Philips and they licensed it off me. And, and that started the licensing thing globally, which I didn't even know what licensing was a week before that. And it's just like, I'll just grab anything and make an opportunity from it. And and that's that's for me, that's what I love. Uh, startups is the, my favorite part of a business because it could go in any direction. Yeah, it's a bit of, bit of adrenaline when you do a startup. It does sound like, though, you are open to the opportunities, and I think maybe that's the key when you're scaling, that you've got to sort of see opportunity everywhere and, and not be closed or think that people are going to knock on your door and, and sort of say, you know, hi, can I help you? You've really got to go out there in some ways, and obviously you were able to do that. Yeah, and it's like I said before, it's not been too fixed on where you want to end up, you know. So it could be some great opportunities. Like the, the Phillips meeting that I went to, I had no I thought I had to pay them. I had, had no idea what I was doing in that meeting. And it wasn't until we got to the end of it and, the, and there was a check involved that I thought, well, this is pretty cool. I wouldn't mind now seeing what licensing actually is. And and that then created the course of my business becoming uh, going away from just being a clothing brand to being a licensed product around the world. Interesting. And you're still involved in that business or have you sort of sold businesses and moved on? How do you how do you sort of do that? Do you do you keep multiple income streams because you've got multiple businesses or do you at some point have you sort of sold it and moved on or just packed up shop? You know, I sold um Attitude many years ago because someone wanted to buy it off me and that was done that whole deal was done in 2 days. And because it was it was sort of not over it, but I was, I was only working three days a year because it was all licensed. So all I had to do was go over the licensed product and, and approval, disapprove of them, and then wait for the royalty check to come in. So I was ready to move on to the next thing, and that's when I was asked to speak at conferences, and that's when I was asked to write books, and I thought, we'll give that a crack. And now, you know, with Customer Culture and Junior Entrepreneur, and we've got a few other businesses as well, I can sit across all of those different income streams, which is cool, but, you know, I've always been about the quality of life of a business owner. So it's also about ensuring that we're spending good quality time as a family together because, you know, I don't want to get to 60 and then go, I've now worked my rear end off and now let me go and spend time with my kids and they're all gone. Absolutely. that That's good advice as well. It sounds like you, you know at the time that you want to walk away from a business. Some people don't. I think some people just hang in there and they're burnt out and they don't enjoy it. You've just shared the story of selling your first business. How will you know when you're you're done with what you're doing now? And you know, do you have any other ideas what might what might be next? Um, look, I, I, for me, it's it's when it's not floating my boat anymore. When it just becomes a thing to create income, uh, it's got to be more exciting than that because I do put my heart and soul into it. And you know, as a business owner, um, and this is a handy tip for anyone looking at starting a business, you are the brand. So. If you're not going to be excited about working on your own business, then, you know, you shouldn't be doing it. So, you know, I'm going to sit across, like the speaking is just 
uh, it's something that I thoroughly enjoy. And before COVID, doing about 100 to 120 of them a year, which I really, really like. So that's sort of getting, I want to get back to that again. And, you know, the junior entrepreneur stuff with it going global is something that is a passion for me because school never made sense to me. I, I could never understand the purpose of school. But when I started a business, I actually then realized, oh, that's right, English and maths are quite important right now. And so that's why I'd love to get kids to see the practical application to schoolwork by starting your own business. Absolutely. And and with taking that global, I mean, how how challenging has that been? Because I guess different different education systems would have different appetite for this kind of content, or have you found it quite universally accepted? Yeah, it's quite universally accepted. It, it's Once again, it's one of those things that I haven't really done anything. I haven't spent any money on advertising for 25 years. I've just found that some of my businesses, like Attitude, right place, right time. Yes, some people say I'm lucky, but, you know, can't have 25 years of luck. And then with junior entrepreneur, people just, especially through the pandemic, kids staying at home, uh, parents wanted to invest more into them, I guess, in other areas. And customer culture, I mean, that's the one way to grow your business is to look after your customers. The bizarre thing is most people don't train their staff on doing that. So that's a nice fit. So it's it's just one of those things that, you know, right place, right time. And I try to stay uh, current or on point to what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. So there might be something else. If we, ha- if we have another global crisis, you probably have another business come out of that. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll wait and see. see. Happens, Let's not wish that upon yeah. anybody though. <laughs> um, just getting a bit more personal now, if you could have one song or a book or a screen show that would actually the one that you go to again and again and it always resonates with you, what would you choose and in one sentence why? Um, look, there's one song which people seem to knock this band, which I never really understand why, but by Nickelback called What Are You Waiting For? And that just always resonates with me. I mean, that's the title of my second book, but which I want to call, I wanted to call Get Off Your Ass, but they wouldn't let me. And it's just one of those, you know, there's, all, we've all got excuses and, you know, it's about just giving it a crack and just start. Absolutely. Well, that, that's good advice. I'll have to go listen to that song. I don't think I've ever heard it, believe it or not, or may have heard it on the radio and not known it was that song. So there you go. Who've been some of your special mentors in your life and what have they taught you about success and I guess the, this, this idea of growth in life? My first mentor, and he still is a major impact in my life still to this day, was a man by the name of Harry Van Dyke, who was the um, CEO of Philips. That's where I met him at the the meeting. And uh, we really clicked. And, uh, you know, I rung Harry a few days after that deal was done and said, look, obviously, obviously, you know, I've got no clue what I'm doing. And he said, yeah, that's fairly obvious. I said, but could you teach me? Because I wanted to, my business was starting to go to that next level. I was a guy that just wanted to upset a lady and I then had to put my big pants on and learn this business stuff. And with Harry being in the position he was, obviously he knew about corporate and all that sort of stuff. And and so he was a massive asset to my business life. And the one thing that he did really drum home early on was not to change because I would do well in corporate because I wasn't corporate. And I, I've never never changed that. You know, I still turn up to meetings in my Converse jeans and T-shirt and no one seems to have a problem with it. But he really did invest a lot of his wisdom into to me. And then, look, all my friends own their own businesses as well. So we sort of tap into each other every now and again. Excellent. It's good to have that network. And as a final takeaway, what would be your best tip to anyone keen to master the politics of growth? Don't be scared. You're going to be out of your comfort zone straight away. If you've never done it before, you don't know what you're doing. So if you embrace that and just, you know, really just have a crack and believe in what you're trying to do. And this is the biggest issue with a lot of people, especially in startups. Other people believe in what they're doing more than they do. And that seems to be where they come unstuck. So, and and then, you know, like I just sort of hinted at, get, surround yourself with people. I, I'm big on and getting mentors, and um, which is different to a coach as far as I'm concerned. But they are different. And having people that have gone down a path that you want to go down and actually have gone down, not have just done a course, you know, surround yourself with those people because other people's mistakes are the best way that you can get yourself to that next level instead of making your own. 
Absolutely. Well, it's been such a pleasure to chat to you. You definitely have a different take on a whole range of issues, but that's what makes you such an interesting guest. If you do want to connect with Justin Herald, I'll have his socials and details at the end of my show notes. You've been listening to The Politics of Everything. I'm Amber Danes. Until next time, keep well. Thanks so much for listening today. If you've enjoyed The Politics of Everything, I thrive on your feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network through Apple, Spotify and all the usual suspects. I'm always on the hunt for new and diverse guests. So if you or someone you know has a fresh idea you're busting to get out there, please email me at amber at amberdanes.com and my crew will get back to you very soon.